Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Matt Anise, who will deep dive into the clinical tactics for achieving dental implant success. If there are any questions, please add them to the Q&A section, and we'll get to them at the end of the webinar. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Dr. Anise, take it away. All right. Thanks, Adam. How are you doing? Um, like Adam said, um, Dr. Anise, uh, thanks all you guys for being here tonight on a Monday night, staying late at the office to kind of go through this presentation with you. So let's get started. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a general practitioner northwest of Boston. Um, I currently have two locations. My primary focus uh, is on complex restorative and dental implants personally, but we do have hygiene, associates, general practice, sealants, fillings, crowns, all of the above. But with me, it's usually sedation, complex restorative, dental implants, and full arch rehabilitation. Um, currently a fellow of the ICOI. I, I'm sitting for the oral exam actually in two weeks for an associate fellow in the AID. And my goal is to become um, a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology. I began my implant dentistry career in 2015. So I graduated Boston University in 2012 with zero implant experience whatsoever. Uh, through continued education, um, gathering as much information, hands-on, I slowly began that career and you know now fast forward seven years later with dental implants it's basically full arch immediate load all on four you know you name it implants is what i do day in and day out um and we're going to kind of do a deep dive into all of the failures that happen with implant dentistry um and i personally experienced probably every single one that we're going to talk about um you know it's it's heartbreaking, it's disheartening, um, but we're gonna kind of learn from my mistakes and the mistakes of many others to find out what we can do to kind of prevent um, or decrease the chance of failure as much as possible with dental implants. Uh, so next 45 minutes or so, um, you know, we're gonna kind of discuss implant failures, what causes them, um, briefly touch on what happens when they fail, some signs, some symptoms, Treatment is in question mark because um, we'll discuss that briefly, but is there really a treatment? Is it kind of maintenance? Is there a chance to regain and restabilize a dental implant that is already showing signs of failing? Um, and we're gonna to touch on equipment, technology, protocols that can be used to help reduce the failure and complications which leads to less headaches for you, which less, uh, lead, uh, less chair time of dealing with headaches, which is a better outcome for you, your team, your patients, and obviously it's a better ROI in the long term. And then obviously I respect your time. I want you to get as much out of this as I hopefully can give to you and then any questions you have at the end. And then I'll provide any contact information for, if you do have a question that pops up, uh, you know, I'm an open book. You can reach me at any time. So we're going to we're going to discuss the signs, symptoms, failing implants. So obviously, you can look at a couple of these photos. If you just do a Google search of failing implants, you're, you're going to sit there and scroll through seven to ten pages of images just like these. Um, you know, the big issue is the way that you know, patients think what dental implants are. They think they're worry-free teeth. They think they don't get cavities. They're in there and they stay in there forever and I don't have to do a thing. Um, I do a lot of consultations and I talk people out of implants and full arch dentistry more than I treat and plan on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we, um, as much implants as I do, you know, typically, well, I think last year we did, you know, over 500 implants in the practices. Um, so it's plenty of experience with them. I am a big proponent of saving natural teeth as much as possible. So I'm not sitting there taking out healthy teeth because a patient asked me to do so. Um, there's complications that we're gonna discuss. Um, it should be a discussion that you have with your patients. Um, so if you do think that you're gonna hear that 97% success rate 
And I think with the experience that I've had, that I think that is a little bit on the higher end based on what I've seen in my practices. So what happens when an implant fails? I mean, most of the time it's pretty obvious in your clinical settings. You're, you're gonna see you know, thread showing, you're gonna see pus, you're gonna see swelling, the patient's gonna report pain. Uh, you take an x-ray, then all of a sudden there's no bone, there's no mobility on the implant and it's not just an abutment screw that's loose. Um, the important thing is what type of fail failure is it or how is it failing and you know, acute versus chronic. Typically an acute failure, um, if you see probably this x-ray on the bottom right, there's gonna be minimal things that you can do to salvage that implant. Um, we'll go through a couple of the treatment options that are out there, but if it's within the first of five, six weeks, you go to take off a cover screw to take a, an impression, the whole implant comes out, it's obviously beyond repair. Versus you have the chronic bone loss that happens over say 10 to 11 years. Um, that's you know through implant design, through splinting, through just natural progression of where implants were 15 years ago to where they are today. Um, you know that's there's a little bit more to do, and it's more important to define what is a failure. Um, we'll get to that, but you know the difference between the two. There's mucositis and periimplantitis. Mucositis is going to be the inflammation of the surrounding tissue surrounding the implants. The good thing about that it is reversible. Uh, there's things that you can do to treat that, to stabilize that, but left unattended, then it can develop into periimplantitis, which is the surrounding structure and bone surrounding implants. But like we said, what is a failure? Um, if you were to say this x-ray on the left-hand side was there for 15 years, there's bone loss, yes, but is that a failure? It's getting really, subject really subjective minus an implant completely coming out of the bone. So it's a bunch of literature that you'll see what is the definition? Is it bone loss? Is it you know complete removal of the implant? Um, that's still kind of a, a gray area, and we're seeing now, especially with the rise of periimplantitis, um, there's been a massive uptick in the amount of periimplantitis presenting in your practice, in my practice, because of the amount of implants being placed, by the patient's awareness of what implants can do to replace missing teeth and from the number of clinicians purely placing dental implants. So treatment, let's say that we have failing dental implants coming in. Obviously the best form of treatment is prevention. Um, that's gonna be, every time I have a patient with a dental implant, they get a full uh, proper home care protocol that's provided to them. It's from my assistant, I repeat it, they repeat it. They know that this isn't a carries free too, that they don't have to worry about. You know, proper oral hygiene is gonna be the greatest success for you because you only see the patient maybe three, maybe four, typically twice a year. Um, you know, say we're starting to see the signs and symptoms when they come in for recall, there's gonna be mechanical deprivement. Um, you know, one of the great things is gonna be the airflow, the air polisher with glycine particles to kind of help deprive also piezo to clean around the threads of the implant. We're still seeing the signs and symptoms after debridement. That's when we go into some chemical treatment. Um, you know, there's citric acid, there's chlorhexidine. Personally, we do a little dilution of sodium chloride or hypochlorite just for just decontaminate the area. That's been shown to be really successful. Um, you can do local site treatment with antibiotics. I personally don't do this, but I know that people will do doxy or the little chips into sites where they're seeing, you know, the signs of periimplantitis or mucositis. Um, and then that gets into surgical debridement and treatment. Um, you can have a full flat thickness. You can go around the implant. You can clean it, debride it, disinfect it, try GVR protocols with membranes and grafting. Lasers are, you know, you see them in literature that you can get great success with lasers. Um, this x-ray, I was actually shocked to see that much success or bone growth after a laser assisted periimplantitis protocol, but it, it's still, it, sometimes it's just the can down the road. Or we could just end up removing the implant, you know, grafting, making sure the ridge and the site is ready for a new implant. So assured, if you know the movie, um, implants will fail. Um, 
it does. I've had cases, I think I had one last week where the surgery was perfect, torque value was perfect, no contraindications, social history, no anything, no signs of swelling, no pain, no discomfort. We went to go take place on the scan body to take a scan for the final crown and the whole implant came out. Um, you're placing a foreign body into the human body and there can just be no rhyme or reason. And it is disheartening. The patients don't understand this. Um, it is, they think everything you went's perfect. And that's why we'll kind of go through some of the verbiages that I say, or you know how I talk to the patients about dental implant therapy, but just know that everyone has failures. If they don't have a failure, they don't place enough implants. Um, so it's okay to fail. It's just how you treatment, how you can rebound and how you can still provide the quality care the patients deserve. Um, so don't be disheartened. I have failures you know, regularly and it's never feels good, even you know, as much as I've seen them in my practice. So implants fail. Some of the things that you can't control, some things that are just completely on the patient. Um, you know, here are some of the contraindications. These aren't the absolute contraindications. These are relative risks associated with patients. Um, you're gonna have autoimmune factors, you know, patients coming in with, you know, autoimmune diseases, it affects the healing, it affects the integration, um, diabetes, delayed wound healing, um, medications, uh, proton prop inhibitors, SSRIs, you have so many medications in polypharma, it's, you're seeing that, you know, there could be an effect on the long-term stability or integration of dental implants, bleeding disorders, blood supply issues, vitamin deficiency, especially vitamin D, um, you, know, you can see it can cause an increased chance of implant failure. Um, and, and then you have a cluster effect, which is more, if you do multiple implant sites on a singular patient, you're gonna have a higher concentration of failures in those patients versus an equal distribution between all the implants that you place. Um, then there's what the patients do when they leave your office. They're gonna go smoke a pack a day, they're gonna go drink you know, heavily, which can affect the liver and the clotting cascade. Um, you know, they sit there, and like I said, they, they feel it's just an artificial tooth that they can finally don't have to do anything about. They can just sit there and stay and it's gonna last forever. Um, and then there's bruxism, um, non-protection, grinding during the day, clenching, that can put extra force on a dental implant. Um, so some of the absolute contraindications, uh, this is swaying in implant dentistry, nasty OI, obviously a recent heart attack or stroke, um, recent valve surgery, long-term immunosuppression, um, bleeding issues that aren't well controlled, iron up values over you know, three plus, um, they're currently going active treatment for malignancy, whether that be radiation therapy, chemotherapy, um, extensive drug abuse, extensive alcohol, um, psychiatric illness. You know, it's their schizophrenia. It's one of the contraindications if it's not stable, well controlled. Um, and then obviously recent IV bisphosphate use, which obviously carries the risk of osteonecrosis, which is something that most people don't want to deal with and can avoid at all costs. So again, why do implants fail? You know, this is beyond the patient's control. Um, so we're gonna go through poor bone quality, lack of vascularization. You know, anyone that places implants, you're gonna feel the difference between one, two, type three, type four bone. Um, you, they say it's like drilling through different types of wood. You can feel the, how much cortical bone there is, where the cortical plate is. That's just through tactile sense. Um, there's other tools that we'll use or talk about shortly that will help us evaluate that. So we're kind of prepared during the implant surgery. Uh, most likely that's gonna be long-term edentulism, um, especially in the posterior maxilla. Um, or if you raise a large flap during the extraction of the tooth, um, you're gonna decrease the periosteum blood supply to the tooth. You're gonna have a much more worse bone quality there than if you were having an atraumatic extraction. Uh, the grafting, you didn't use the right type of bone graft to maintain the space to have the bone quality. You have something that resorbed too fast. Um, that's something where, you know, it's kind of a one size fits all, a lot of people think, versus just like your different implant sizes, shapes, um, diameters, widths, 
that your grafting protocol should kind of follow suit to what you want to achieve long term. And the membrane placement, you know, sometimes there's no membrane placement at all. It's just a collar plug that isn't going to last long term. Um, it, it's really maintaining, setting yourself up for success during the surgical phase is going to help give you proper bone for long term dental implant success. Um, and then there's obviously lack of adequate space, anatomic structures, your maxillary sinus, your nasal floor, your inferior alveolar nerve, your mental nerve, um, you know, all these things come into play. Typically in the maxilla, you're able to augment your sinus lifts, lateral windows, your crystal lifts. When you get down to the IAN, that's when things get a little bit dicey, or I kind of say with personally, I, I don't do nerve movements. I, you know, really do large block grafting, um, but that's obviously some structure that's going to give us not the adequate height to maintain the stress, especially in the posterior mandible. And so then there's going to be poor surgical techniques, things that we do wrong as a clinician. Um, I've probably been, again, now seven years in, um, you know, I've kind of learned from my mistakes. I've probably made these mistakes. Um, so, and then now there's checklists and protocols that we go through that help us not make the same mistakes. Um, you know, poor irrigation, overheating the bone, that's going to be particularly important with guides. Um, you're going to need the second person for irrigation with the monoject when doing guides because the motor is going to provide just enough irrigation as is. You're cutting with dull burrs. Uh, you get an implant kit when you buy your first 20 implants and they last until you lose them or the assistant throws them away or they look rusty. That isn't true. Most implants have a longevity or lifespan. Um, you know, they're gonna be typically by manufacturer, but depending on bone quality, the amount of use, the amount of sites, it's around 20-ish sites per drill. Um, excessive bone, compression of bone, um, torquing, the implant down, you know, past 70 Newton centimeters, it's stable, you get primary stability, which you know, some people think, well, it's, it's stable, it's going to stay in there, which always is an indication of secondary stability or long-term stability. Um, improper depth of placement. Uh, you're afraid that there's the nerve too far below, and if you go too far subcrestal, that you're going to hit something that you don't want. There's that lingual concavity that you want to stay away from, so I'm going to be safe and place it a little bit above the crest of bone. Um, we're going to discuss that with you know, some of the concepts now, but it's going to lead to bone loss is going to cause the thread show improper. We're sort of designed because of the improper depth of placement. Uh, your preparation, the osteotomy, you go into that D4 bone that we talked about and it's 5.2 by 10 and you prep it to a 5.1 you're not gonna get 20 Newton centimeters on that. It's just gonna spin. Um, so you have to know the different bone profiles. You have to know and manage that. You have to know what drill that you wanna use based on the feel and tactile sense. So you wanna make sure that you have the right preparation of your osteotomy with the right drill sequence for the right bone. Um, sometimes this is gonna be true in the full arch. Uh, this is true for me, especially. In the beginning, I did a lot of the sackable guides where I did a lot of excessive bone reduction to get the guide to fit, to get the reduction plane to fit, to get the temp cylinders on the multi-units and uh, to get the prosthesis to fit with, you know, 14 millimeters. If you're doing upper or lower together, then it's 14 up top, 14 down below. So sometimes you're taking away a lot of bone. And then now moving to the protocol that I do that we'll touch on a little bit later. You, you'll see like the keratinized tissue, the amount of bone that I could have avoided going for more of an FP1 design. Again, this is going more of the full arch protocol that I can you know, answer any questions. It's on the topic tonight, but it's bone is only there for a certain period of time. You take it away and you know, if things fail or if things go wrong, now you're going into zygomas, pterygoids, you're going into, um, you know, periosteal, periosteal implants that can be you know, 3D printed, but it's causing more headaches in the future instead of just doing it correctly from the first time. Um, another big thing that I did was I did not prevent micro movements uh, in some of the cases, particularly over dentures. Um, I always tried in the past to do a stage one surgery. That means 
that I have a healing abutment, no stage two, no uncovery, healing abutment on top. You know, sometimes I just have the soft healing abutments in the beginning and some are almost at the height of the adjacent molars. You sit there and put food or bolus in there, they're gonna bite and chew on that. And micro movements is gonna be the number one cause of implant failure. I think it's like 60% of some of the mechanicals or preventable reasons for failure is micro movements. Um, if you have anything removable going on, um, a flipper, a you know, re removable partial denture, a complete overdenture, just bury it because even though it's a piece of acrylic going on, the compression, the tensile forces, the movement around is going to put a lot more of those micro movements onto the dental implant. Um, that is something I've learned the hard way. Um, so anytime I have something removable, I'm doing two stage. And another important thing was, you know, removal of the keratinized tissue. And, you know, you've heard the old adage of bone sets the tone. Um, you know, if you place the implant where the bone is, uh, it doesn't matter if there's no attached tissue, it's integrated, it's fine. And, you know, the biggest thing that came out of implant dentistry recently um, you know, the zero bone loss concept that, you know, I'll kind of show in the next slide, it, it's respecting the vascular supply, getting the amount of the correct keratinized tissue, getting the amount of attached tissue is going to be one of your biggest indications for long-term success. Uh, so here's that zero bone loss concept uh, by Dr. Thomas Likovicius. Um, you know, basically, his big thing is you need at least three millimeters um, you know, from the height of the implant, and that's going to be the amount of attached tissue that you need. So there's going to be a lot more augmentation needed for long-term success. The proper depth, you're going to go subcrestal based on the tissue. Um, you're going to have a screw retaining crown. You're going to have a conical connection. Ideally, your profile is supposed to be hygienic compression of the tissue so that there is no food trap and the tooth shapes the tissue. So, you know, since, you know, this publication, this book, you know, this is something I've really focused on, um, you know, the last few years where we're doing a lot more PRF, we're doing a lot more soft tissue augmentation, we're going, you know, pretty far subcrestal, we're profiling the bone, and ideally everything's screw retained. Um, so, again, another failure is going to be poor surgical placement. And when we go back to that definition we had before, you know, is this a failure? I mean, you could sit there and say, well, it's integrated, there's a crown on top, and, you know, they're smiling, they have a tooth that they didn't have. You know, in my mind, this is 100% of failures, kind of all of these, but that, that's one of those gray areas that we talked about in the beginning. You know, a lot of this could have been avoided and done a lot differently with some of the techniques that we're going to talk about, but you know, this in my practice is a failure, especially with a high smile line with an aesthetically demanding patient. Recovering this is nearly impossible. Um, you know, this left-hand side with that placement, yeah, it's a front tooth, but we've all seen, I've seen friends that have smiled that have implants placed like that. And it's one of those things you can't unsee. And then obviously placement, of uh, the ones on the right where you have something going through the buccal plate, you have something going through the palatal plate, you have something into the nose. Uh, just because you have sinusitis surrounding an implant in the sinus doesn't mean it's a sinus lift. Um, getting too close to the nerves, going through the lingual plate, you know, hitting an adjacent tooth, all of these things with what the technology that we have today should and can be completely avoided. Um, another reason for failure is going to be poor prosthetic design. Um, that could be inaccurate impression techniques, um, you know, the right material, are you sending to the right lab, are they pouring up an alginate? Um, if you're doing multiple implants, are they splinted with GC pattern or something similar? Um, that's it, getting an accurate impression of where the implant is, that's going to give you a proper restoration that's going to have low torque on the screws that hold the implant in place and the abutments that hold the implant in place, um, you know, some digital margins for spent retained. Um, it's ideally you try to get everything screw retained. Uh, there's cases aesthetically where there's some times that we have to use spent retained. If you do, um, try to keep margins super gingival where possible so cement is easily to be cleaned. 
or if you have the cement sub G, you can do a um, cement it outside the mouth, clean around it, then insert it. Uh, there's, there's ways you can do that to extrude the cement outside the mouth and then insert it. So there's as little cement as necessary to cement the crown. Sometimes in the facial, too much compression on the tissue, that's gonna be more aesthetically or more aesthetic than anything. You're gonna have you know, tissue recession because of the amount of pressure that's happening from the prosthetics. And a big thing is you say you're just doing the prosthetic phase for implants. And a lot of people will get the little small circular uh, healing cap. They'll take that off, take an impression, and the lab will get back similar to this x-ray, where it kind of looks like boots on a rooster. That's you know, the term I've seen from multiple people. Um, you know, the bone and the shape should determine the tissue. That's going to cause less food impaction, um, even if you have to do a second stage surgery. Ideally, you have the crown contoured to the bone and not to the tissue. And that's an issue you're seeing food impaction patients don't like the way it feels. It, it, just, it just doesn't seem like a natural tooth. And again, there's techniques and ways that we can avoid that that we'll go over. Uh, full arch, like you'll see, I've had one of these cases that came out exactly like this, where the most distal implant came out because it was an FP2 or FP3 that was placed like this, never taken out and then had a ridge lap where food just accumulated. You should always have with anything non-removal and ovate in Taglio um, that's cleansable, that if it's not cleansable, it should be removed more often. And I know some people say, if you have a proper design with an ovate, the whole Intaglio aspect that you can delay or extend um, you know, the removal and cleaning of the prosthesis for, you know, even a much longer time than six months or once a year, so to speak. Uh, premature loading. Uh, you get an implant back. It was placed two months ago by the oral surgeon. Oh, it, the torque value is at you know, 60 or 50 or 45 or 35 or whatever you want, Newton centimeters. Um, you know, they think, okay, that equates to primary stability. So it should be ready to go because it's past the three week mark. Um, you know, sometimes in T4 bone where you know the torque value isn't that great, where the bone quality isn't that great, you might have to extend that. And it's not every implant is, okay, they all go at the same timeline. There's not all universal healing across patients. Biology is different. So there's ways that we can know with pretty certainty when we're good to go to restore dental implant. Um, and then there's poor occlusal forces and load. Um, it's not going down the long axis of the implant. Uh, we have to put a cantilever because the patient wants a tooth in the aesthetic zone. They, it's just, you have two implants put together. That's gonna cause premature load. That's gonna cause some bone loss or it could cause mechanical fracture of the implant. Um, and this is some mechanical fractures. Uh, I had to remove an implant Friday, the distal aspect of a hybrid, which is never fun to do. I had to trephine it and get it out. Um, it, it will happen. S screws will break, abutments will break, um, but being able to retrieve it is it, huge because you will see that it's, it is not fun. Um, so here's a kit that I personally have, the screw and implant removal master kit from Salvin. Um, you know, it comes in handy when you need it, which hopefully isn't that often, but it does happen. Implants can fracture, they can mushroom, and they can have an abutment or screw fracture, multi-unit fracture. Um, you know, I've had it all at this point, which is, again, not a fun day to have. Um, so those are some of the big reasons for failure. Um, those are some of the biggest things that I see. So what the big question is what can we evaluate? What tools do we have at our disposal? And you know, what is available to help us prevent these failures as much as possible? And with me, no matter what, it always starts with the proper consent, prognosis, and understanding that it's both me and if I'm if you're not placing it, you're just the restorative dentist. It's you, the surgeon, and the patient working together to maintain the longevity of implants. Um, I, I stress that over and over. Don't ever say it's an implant. You're good to go. It's 97% success. It is your know, replacement tooth that you don't have to worry about. That I think you'll see, especially now with the rate of peri implantitis getting up, you know, in the mid 20% of 
implants going over, you know, it just goes from 11 to 22 after 10 years. Um, it, it's, I, I show them the x-ray of every implant procedure I do. I show them the guy that we made. I show them the pre-planning and I show them how well it went and then everything's up to them. You, you set the expectation that things can fail and usually you can recover failure with grafting and replacement, but it's letting them down thinking it's easy, it's a slam dunk when I've had cases that were supposed to be easy that have caused me headaches you know, still to this day. So it's discussions to have with your patients. Um, like I said, every implant clinician is gonna have failures on cases they never thought they would fail. Um, if they don't, if they say that doesn't happen, you, know, you have that YouTube video or that viral story that happened I think last month or two months ago where some lady talked about all the things that implants cause and kind of pushed by a dentist that says he plays implants better than everyone else. It, it's, it doesn't work that way. It's, you have a person on the other side, you have biology, you have genetics, you have social factors, all the things that we've discussed so far. But you know, the biggest thing is your implant that you choose to place. Uh, there's the original brain and mark implant with the external hex, the design, the threads, the osteointegration. Um, you know, what is the size, the width, the length that you place? Um, some, you know, the old way was go as long as possible can go, you know, go 15, go 17, go, um, go as wide as you can go. You know, if it's number nine, it has to be five millimeters. There, there was no adaptation to the bone. It was just a universal, okay, it's this tooth number, which obviously has been disproven, you know, this day with the technology that we have, you know, at least eight millimeters in length, at least four millimeters in width. Those are pretty good parameters to stay with. Um, you know, if you have a couple of meters, I usually like to stay in the <clears throat> four two to five by eight to 10. I mean, that's my wheelhouse. Full arch, I'll go to a 13, sometimes 15, 16 millimeters to get stability or bicortical stabilization. But, you know, that's typically my single implant wheelhouse. You know, your connection is going to be really important. Um, you know, that's going to, remove the micro gap that you see down below. <clears throat> you know, the original ones were the external hexagon or the eternal hex, which have fallen out of favor. Now, I personally prefer more safer designs. Um, they're they're going to have a much smaller micro gap. They're going to maintain the bone level, I think, to the best. And the maintenance of the bone is, you know, one of the better prosthetic connections that you do have. Your thread design, is it aggressive? What's the pitch? What's the thread type? Um, your surface treatment, almost all implants are treated. Um, nowadays, your color design, you know, does it bevel in? Does it stay out? Is it smooth? Are you gonna get the first thread effect? Platform switching, now I think it's almost universal between almost all implants. Um, that's where your prosthetic connection is smaller than your width of your platform that's going to prevent you know the first bone loss effect that's going to be your biologic width in theory going into the prosthetic connection um so it's i personally i place two types of implants um you know it's typically bio horizons um that's my single implant and for my full arch hybrid i personally like need it um that there's reasons i can go in a little bit later um based on those but it's basically, that's what I'm kind of sticking to at the moment. Um, and then how do we evaluate the surgical site and the bone quality? Obviously CBCT, um, I think it should be universal in every practice. Um, that's, I stand by that. I, there was a thread or question asked in a Facebook group recently, and I've taken, I think we counted today, well over a thousand and I've never charged for it. It, it pays for itself. That might sound crazy. It might sound like I'm giving it away but it's paramount based on diagnosis, not even in implants, but, you know, periapical lesions, bone quality, grafting, uh, endodontics, um, airway is, you know, I know a little gray area, but it, it pays for itself time and time again. And with the cost coming down to, you know, 50, 60, $70,000, it, it's pays for itself in a year. Um, but even, um, yeah, this is a CBCT I have from Acteon Natrium. Um, here I can evaluate the bone quality. Um, you know, I can sit there and see the density levels. I can see what type of surgery I'm trying to plan. Um, how good is this? What's the vascularization? What's the corticalization? What's the medullary bone there? It, it gives me a good indication of what my surgery is going to feel like and how it's going to go. Um, obviously, it's going to evaluate 
anatomical structures that you want to avoid that we talked about earlier, but then those concavities, those defects from a previous extraction that you had no control of, that the graphs didn't take, that there's a concavity that if you look at it, you know, intraorally it looks fine and then it blows away completely. Um, and then you need the CBCT for guided surgery. Um, it's, I think guided is by far the way to go. And like I said, with the evaluation of the bone, if I'm seeing T4 poor bone quality, I'm going to stop that, you know, 1.5 millimeters below the implant that I want to place. Um, and then I can go from there. So it helps me kind of be prepared, know what I anticipate, but I'm able to adapt when things don't go as, as planned. Um, another huge thing are tools there. If you're doing this extraction and you're going to craft it and you're going to do a second stage surgery, know how to do HMATIC extractions. Um, you're going to maintain the vascular supply. Um, especially in the buccal aspect, you lay a flap, you sit there and chop bone, there goes the periosteum, there goes the blood supply, and the bone quality is going to kind of decrease significantly. Um, you shouldn't need buccal plates to remove teeth, root tips. I, again, I've taken out personally tens of thousands of teeth, and I still, the only time removing a buccal plate is on an impacted third molar. It's surgical techniques that you really want to get good at, HMATIC extractions. Um, and there's tools. This is the Luxata from Directa. That's in every single extraction kit that is on my operatory when I'm taking on a tooth. I also have the cube. This is going to help. You know, you can go right around the tooth, remove the PDL, and the tooth pops up pretty easily. It's also great for lateral windows, grafting, ridge splits. Um, you're going to be a lot less harmful towards the soft tissue, the bone, the post-op sensitivity is great. So, you know, piezo surgery, um, you know, doing complex surgery and implant surgery, something I definitely recommend looking into. Uh, absolutely necessary, no, but it's a great toy to have. Um, and when you do this, your implant site's gonna be more predictable. There's gonna be great blood supply. You didn't disrupt the periosteum, you, the vascularity, uh, the width is going to be maintained. And obviously it's a lot easier to graft, you know, a four wall site than it is when you have a defect. Now you have to add membranes, now your costs go up. Now you're placing PTFE, you're doing Memflex or some long-term non-resorbable uh, membrane just to maintain the site. Uh, this is probably one of the biggest things that we've adopted the last year or so is the use of PRF and other biologics, um, doing implant dentistry. And it, it's amazing to see the healing that, you know, PRF slugs uh, provide. Um, you know, it's the wound healing after one week is almost like nothing happened. Um, it's almost amazing or almost a miracle. And it's basically the cost of a butterfly, um, Butterfly needle, a couple tubes, and the osseous, the interspin. Um, you know, the handling of the bone after this is actually a picture I took, of course, I was teaching. Uh, that's the bone graft particulate with um, some of the liquid from the person's own blood to make sticky bone. Um, the, way, the way it handles, is, it's amazing doing bone grafts without it. Um, you know, the post-operative discomfort, it, it's significantly decreased. Um, and one thing that I'm doing with full arch, uh, it's basically we're laying this down over the crest of ridge um, in between the implants. We're placing our 3D printed prosthesis and we're kind of leaving keratinized tissue on both sides. And we're just doing a couple simple mattress sutures and letting it heal by secondary intent. And we're gaining significant amounts of keratinized tissue. Uh, it's get in your assistants love it. They love talking about it. It's the way they talk to the patients about it. It's much more than them sucking spit or you know just being there to let you do everything. They do all the own blood draws. They spin it down. They talk to the patients about it. They get their consent. Um, I, I think I was hesitant about it. I you, you know it came on like two three years ago and. You know, I bought enough implants to get a free machine. So I got a free machine or a discounted machine. And I, you know, after using it the last months or so, it's, I couldn't imagine practicing implant dentistry without it. So that's something I highly recommend getting into, looking into, learning more. There's 
multiple resources. Um, you know, we sit there and draw blood on almost every you know, surgery now. It's gonna maintain the tissue, that zero bone loss concept that we talked about in the past. Um, it, it's gonna be a huge aid in that. Uh, sinus lifts, you can lift with just pure PRF. Um, you know, if you have to take care of nice tissue to add some from the palate, you can put PRF in place of where the donor site was and the post-op sensitivity of that pizza burn that patients hate or that they refuse to get the graft is almost gone. And there's that sticky bone, like I mentioned. Um, so another important thing is the surgical techniques and all the surgical things that we went wrong. Make sure that you're doing pumping motion during the osteotomy. You're not leaving the drill running at, you know, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 RPM just in the bone. That's going to overheat the bone. That's going to cause vascular damage. That's going to cause, it's going to ruin the cells in the site. Pumping motion, good irrigation, having the assistant irrigate too with you. Uh, sharp drills, here's a chart from BioHorizons. Uh, they give this, you can get it, you can hang it into your sterilization like I do, get it laminated. So they know after each one, when they go to sterile to break down the instruments, they know which ones we use. And then we just order as we need to. We're not just ordering a bunch of new kits, but that, that's something that I wasn't aware of. Um, I had you know a series of chronic failures for a period of time. Then we realized we were just using the same kit. Um, you know, that was like three years in, it wasn't something that wasn't talked about. So the reason why I say that's important is because I had like 10 implants failed you know, all within a small window because we we're just using dull burrs. We really got surgery. It's the printer technology is there, the CVCT is there, the internal scanners, the cost of getting into all of it. You can use an outside lab to do it. <clears throat> it's something that you know, should be done. It's there, it's easy to do. And make sure that you prepare the osteotomy. Don't just go by the drill report that comes with a guided surgery. Know the tactile sense. Evaluate it with the CVCT. Evaluate it. Know how to read bone, how to look at it, how long it's been edentulous, where it's located. Just plan to tactile surgical sense, um, you know, not just based on, okay, my drill report says to go to here. Um, I do still believe, even with guided surgery, the visibility of bone because my first couple of guided surgeries, I thought I can do a punch and we didn't have the right curing settings for the resin that I was using on the printer that I was using. And all six of those failed because they weren't placed properly. And I just thought, okay, well, this means I can punch the bone. You still don't want to get rid of that keratinized tissue. <clears throat> you still want to do like a lingualized flap to maintain the tissue, but you want to see the bone, you want to see the imprint go in, you want to evaluate that even with guided surgery. And you want to make sure that you handle the tissue properly. Like I said, it's punching is removing keratinized tissue that you can't get back without grafting, without doing PRF, making sure that you respect what's a task because that's going to be your lifeline for the long-term success of your implants. And a thing that I started doing, um, uh, credit, you know, 3D dentists, of course, that I help teach at, that we're doing the impressions at the time of surgery. And that's going to get rid of us relying on the tissue to dictate the size and shape of the implants, but rather it's gonna be, you know, us with ideal design, with ideal contours, even if we have to do a second stage, open up, place the crown and let it heal by a secondary intent to have a natural crown that if you looked at the mouth of the patient felt it would be a natural too. Again, that's gonna be one indicated, that's gonna be with your ISQ that we're gonna talk about your readings at the time of surgery. Here's that ISQ. This is your bone to implant contact. This is a little tool, a little peg that you put on the implant at the time of surgery. This is gonna be a lot better indicator than your torque value. Um, you know, this is your chart over here on the right-hand side. You know, your numbers go from zero to 100. You know, 16 below, you wanna bury. <clears throat> 60 to you know, 70, you kinda of wanna do a two-stage follow-up. And 70 says you can do single load loading. Again, I'll just put a healing button there, take my impression, knowing that it's probably not gonna move um, where I can deliver my final restoration. So it's great, it's gonna be a better indicator than a surgical torque. <clears throat> and here is, I mean, I think I couldn't live without my intraoral scanners. Uh, between the two practices, I have three trios, two medit, and an ITRO. So it's something that we use day in, day out. Um, 
implant ground designs that are going to be that you have full control of. Um, you know, this is going to allow you to do fully guided crown down techniques where you're going to be able to get screw retained almost every single time. It's going to allow you for occlusal access to be directed along the long axis of the implant. That's going to prevent fracture, bone loss, get loads that the implant can't handle. Um, you know, the accuracy for a single implant, I, I can't remember the last time I've taken an implant crown scan without, you know, traditionally. Um, we use it, I use it for full arch sort of another technique that I'll show you shortly, but it's there. It makes, I do maybe two PVS impressions for single units a year, uh, small design, small simulation, you know, it's the CAD design with ExaCAD with Blue Sky Plan with Three Shape Studio. Um, it, it's amazing. And these scanners themselves, the software they're adapting to, like the Medit has a crown design module that have automatic faces, smile simulations. <clears throat> they are, I couldn't practice any shoot without these. So this is going to allow you to have your implants kind of be nearly perfect with a combination of this and the uh, you know, CT scan and the surgical guide. This is something that we sure start getting into. It's going to be the facial scanning. Um, this is more for the high end aesthetic cases, the full arch cases. You're going to be designing it based on the face outwards. Um, it's going to be a little bit more reliable than just purely photos. And mostly because I can merge the CBCT data, I can merge the intraoral scan data and the facial data and then design you know, profile. I can look at every aspect of the patient's face and fully come up with a comprehensive treatment plan and make the surgical guide based on the proposed teeth. Uh, it's something that it's amazing technology and it's only gonna get better. So adapting this for your high end aesthetic cases, for your full arch cases, I, I think it's going to be a lot better than just taking you know, two dimensional photos because did you capture the right photo? You can go through multiple different scans with the patient. Uh, photogrammetry. This is something I use, you know, whenever we do full arch. Um, I know intraoral scans are accurate. There's scan bodies that you can do without, but the feeling of a hybrid going in uh, without a tie base into one of these, it's, it's unlike anything until you feel it. Um, it's not going to be for your single implants. It can be for your single implant bridges. It doesn't have to be full arch. Um, but the tools and technologies, this is a picture I took last week on a case that we had <clears throat> using the pick. I do have the pick. I do have the eye cam. I know there's a third one coming out. It is going to be, it just, you don't need the transfer impressions. You don't need the verification jigs when you're doing this. <clears throat> the accuracy of it, it's better in my mind than any sort of transfer jig or I've done a lot of the you know cases with a guided full with you know jig transfers that were based on the original design and you're still getting that creep that you always hate to hear putting in zirconia you know we're delivering no tie bases on our zirconias and a lot of it's to do with this technology um, it, it's constantly adapting I think there's going to be a third player coming soon from what I hear to this so it's not just going to be these two but it's something that you know, makes my surgical protocol significantly easier getting into more of the full arch. And again, I have both just because it's, I'm not tied to any company. I know it's, there's teens, it's pick only or I can, but I think they're both great products from what my experience has been. And the biggest thing is going to be 3D printing. Um, this is the sprint ray that I have. Um, this is actually one of the cases, a full arch case that I delivered last week. Um, you can see no tie bases, right to the multi-unit directly. These are just 3D printed staining glazed. Um, this is by far, if you're going to invest in one thing, it's going to be 3D printing. Um, you know, your surgical guides, your custom healing abutments, they're going to be scalped to with the size of the teeth that you want. They're not going to be sticking above the gums, so you're not going to be chewing on them, preventing those micro movements, but you're still going to get a nice contoured crown that emerges from the gums rather than sits on top of them. Your temporary crowns, um, I use them for 3D printed full arch. Um, that's kind of my wheelhouse with these. Uh, and then splints to protect your implants or splints for all your patients that you know, you're printing out 
you know, a couple of dollars for two of them and, you know, still charging, you could charge the $500, $400 fee that you used to charge. And then they can just get new ones whenever they break. And the one thing that I use them a lot for too is for temporary crown and bridge, when I'm doing kind of a mix of tooth born and implants where I'm taking out teeth, placing implants, burying them, but then I'm also doing temporary crowns on the teeth that are prepped. This is gonna, you know, if you ever try to do bisacryl or the flash underneath them and the unhygienic or the tissue inflammation, you have a 3D printed temp that fits right to the tooth like a crown would, the tissue response is, you know, it's immaculate. It's something that's gonna be long-term success, decreased inflammation, decreased inflammation is gonna be long-term implant success too in those cases. So this is kind of just a couple of cases we did last week, utilizing you know all the techniques that we kind of talked about for implant success. Again, this is more my wheelhouse with you know the full arch. You know, these are all same day, same day deliveries, extractions with you know six implants <laughs> with PRF placement with you know ideal FP1 designs. Um, some are FP2, FP3 ish, but it's it depends on the smile line and the bone available to the patient. Um, you know, this is kind of why I'm so excited about implant dentistry and the technology that we use. Um, it's, it's amazing to see you know, the responses that we can do. And you know, with this workflow, it's a big capital investment, but our you know, lab costs in decrease, it's, you're saving about $5,000 a case in costs associated with these cases by doing this. So a couple, you know, a year pays for most of the equipment and we're doing probably about 10 to 12 a month. And a lot of it's worth both referrals, you know, from patients that have gone through the procedure. So, and then there's always what's next. And, you know, there's going to be probably 3D printed of biologic materials of, you know, scaffolding that can go in that's bioresorbable, of uh, changeable like tissue, um, you know, CAD designs of 3D printed metal subperiosteals or designs or things that, you know, can hold implants where you're not going into the zygomatic or pterygoid process where, you know, some periosteals can kind of come back that are custom fitted and milled and CAD designed and 3D printed to the patient. Uh, robotics, um, you know, the Da Vinci is almost ubiquitously used in all hospitals. Um, you know, we actually are, I think, expecting the Yomi pretty soon in our office, um, where it's full haptic feedback of robotic placement of implants where it's, there's, almost no room for error. I mean, there's almost no chance of error. And then who knows? I mean, I can't believe what's come out in the last seven years since I started this journey. Um, you know, I kind of dove in and got, I took in everything fully. It's been amazing. And each time jumping on, you know, these protocols, these procedures, the technology, it makes the next thing easier. You're not just trying to swallow everything at once. So, I mean, I'm a big proponent of Jumping in, starting slow, obviously first steps, but I mean, like I said, I've used all these, you know, things that we've talked about between 3D printers, guides, 3D printed teeth, um, digital scanners, we have it all in the office. Excited about the robot, um, you know, coming soon. I think it's in June, July, but um, that's all I have today. So questions for, it's a question time, right, Adam? Yes, sir. We've got quite a few. So let's get right to them. Uh, first one came in relatively early. Um, what do you do if you have a spinner and cannot go up in length or diameter? So typically, I mean, I never go to the maximum width that you have. If you could, you have different types of implant designs. You could go for more uh, aggressive thread design. Like I said, I have a bio horizons and I have a knee dent. Um, my drive is going to be my more aggressive thread. I've had spinners where I've had to go to a more aggressive thread, pet, um, thread pitch. That's one thing. Otherwise, it's graph, go back in and re, re attack it. Um, but if you, if you have an underprepared osteotomy and poor bone, that kind of eliminates um, a lot of that. But if you can't go wider, you can't go longer, it could be a, a pitch thread count or just depth of uh, more aggressive implant. What's the best way to determine if an implant is ready for restoration? Um, I think the Ostel, the ISQ um, that's coming out, the Penguin um, is another thing that measures the ISQ score. Um, you know, usually they say over 70 is when you say, hey, this is ready to go. Um, 
So it shouldn't be based on surgical torque value. Um, but the if you take an ISQ at surgical placement and you know it's a pretty good score, you can test it again at two months. You can test it at three months before you restore. Um, you know sometimes in D four <clears throat> bad you know posterior number two that you're placing, you know give it a little bit of extra time and check. Are titanium implants now available in both the normal uh, rock cast process process as well as the new 3D printed? And if yes, how long have 3D printed ones been approved for use? For implants, I haven't heard of 3D printed implants yet. I mean, typically now it should be titanium or zirconia. I, I don't, yeah, I've never heard of 3D printed implants. All right, moving on. If you're placing two locator implants on the lower arch at the canine position, do you angulate them slightly dis distally for better retention? Uh, I mean, most of the prosthetics or your RTXs or your, um, you know, your abutments hanging, they have an angulation correction. So it, it can be up to 30 to 40 degrees with some of the RTXs um, or the Nova Lock can go 20 degrees. So I try to keep it as parallel as possible. Um, and I mean, with overdentures, I'm a big fan of the Novalock system. Um, it has the peak inserts uh, that don't wear that much. So the retention, I think, I've had great success with those. Uh, all right. And then follow up to that. Um, also, do you need to reduce the ridge to a flat surface from posterior to anterior? Uh, with an overdenture, no, because you have flanges that accommodate. If you're doing immediate, say, if, if they're edentulous, then go a little bit subcrestal. Um, I mean, make sure you have good quality bone. Sometimes if they've been edentulous for a while, you're going to have that you know, flabby ridge, which is half soft tissue, half bone. Um, I don't plane just to get uh, just a flat profile um, with an overdenture. I barely even, I don't really do that minorly, even for full arch. Um, I don't see the you know, need for that. You're removing a lot of healthy bone that you, know, you could be utilized in the future. When an implant fails and you redo it, do you charge the patient for the new graft and new implant or crown or eat the, the I personally don't. I have an all-in approach. Um, you know, anything I treat and plan, anything I do in my office, I stand by. We have, you know, if it goes right, awesome. It's a pretty high ROI. Um, you know, it's to extract and graft again. It's, I, I personally stand by my work. I I like to just sit there and say, here's your all-in fee. I stand by that. As long as there's proper home care, you haven't missed a recall appointment, everything went as well as possible. And it was just one of the situations like we talked about at the beginning where, but if they're going out smoking three packs a day, haven't come in for three years, then okay, yes, there's going to be charges associated with that. So it's never like a one size fits all. It's more just a patient specific kind of choice and discussion I have with the patients. Is your screw retrieval kit for fractured implants universal for any implant system? Uh, yes. Uh, the one I use again is from Salvin um, that I use. It has size of diameters or have internal connection types. So you just have to know the type of screw connections and you just have to make a divot into the screw, screw and run it out at 50 in reverse. Um, but yeah, it's not implant kit specific. It's not implant specific. They'll have different designs for you know, the different platforms. What codes do you use for LPRF? I don't charge. Uh, there's biologics, there's codes that you use. Um, again, if I'm getting this much better surgical outcome, and again, the cost is pretty minimal and the outcome is that much more predictable for me, that's where I'm looking at it with the less headaches, more success and better patient outcome that is going to be decreased hair times for any sort of future complications. I just have that built in. I, I get, I usually don't do a lot of code breakdowns. It's usually universal fees um, with, you know, case fees that we do. That's my personal approach. How far subcrustally do you recommend placing implants? Uh, I like to be, again, it depends on where the tissue ends up. If you have really thick keratinized tissue, you could be, you know, millimeter subcrustal. Um, if it's an immediate placement, you want to be below not just the alveolus, but you also want to be below the crest because you're going to have remodeling that takes effect. If you're doing more of immediate, um, two, about two millimeters of crestal, I'm happy with. Um, you know, if there's plenty of connective tissue, if it's a thin tissue type, I'll go deeper. If it's thicker, I'll stay right around 1.5, two. Uh, let's see, a couple more here. Um... 
SBM versus SLA surface, does it make a difference on failure rate? Uh, I personally have, the, you go through literature based on the surface texture, um, the issue with micro porosity you're going to have is you're going to have greater osteointegration, but then there could be an increased chance of adhesion for bacteria. There isn't a universal, like this, you're going to hear implant companies say they're the best surface treated. You have the aquaporous, you have them coated in bio um, hydroxy appetite. I think just I don't see the, this one implant stands out personally, based on my experience. It's, I think it's a lot more marketing than trying to get the surface ideal, but I think if it's an FDA approved company with a well reputable brand, the surface texture is fine. If the facial plate is missing and you have a three wall defect, can you graft without a membrane between the bone graft and soft tissue? Ideally, you place them. I like to always place a menflex in those issues at minimum. Um, sometimes PTFE um, depends on the height. If it's going down, say, you know, a millimeter or two, you can layer down PRF. Um, it depends where your implant's going to be, where you want your ridge to be. I, I think hey, there's so many different factors between three wall. It could just be a millimeter below, and you're going to get remodeling anyways. Um, but, you know, Memflex, 32, 36 week, um, you know, resorbable membrane there is just going to help prevent any sort of soft tissue vagination into your implant site and just lead to long term success. So I don't think it's a big need and you know, it's a pretty easy surgery to handle. Um, are you on social media? And if so, what are your handles? Oh, sorry. Yeah. There. So, <laughs> sorry. If anyone wants to email, there's my email. Uh, Instagram. That's my Instagram. And then Facebook, that's just find me in my first and last name. Um, but yeah, if anyone has questions, ask my personal email. I meant to put that up earlier. Um, and anything, cases that we do, I try to keep up with the photos. I, I just, there's some people that blow me out of the water with the stuff they post. I just, sometimes it's too busy. Uh, but yeah, you can follow me around, ask questions, shoot me a DM, shoot me an email anytime. Great. You have a couple more questions or sorry, a couple more minutes for a few yeah, more. Yeah, I'm good. Right. Um, um, let's see. What was the name of the Luxator instrument you mentioned for a traumatic extractions? It's called Luxator. It's from Directo. Uh, it's a periotome. Again, I swear by it. I've used it for the last 10 years. I can get any tooth out with it. Um, it's I've fat, the black one, which is three millimeters, I believe, and the green one for root tips. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, any parazone, luxator, something like that, but <clears throat> apical, small apical pressure to pop the roots out to keep it atraumatic. Um, yeah, that's, I think a huge tool in your surgical chest. All right. I've got a comment from your office manager for the PRF question. The code is D7921. All right. <laughs> so thank you, Jenna. <laughs> um, any special protocols for a single implant first week with antibiotics and rinses? I do. I always like to do. Um, I know there's the overprescription and antibiotics um, in dentistry in general. Um, I usually do, if it's a single implant, I'll do a, you know, sometimes a four milligram of DEX if there's no diabetes. And then I'll just do like a pre med, like the, you know, 2000, uh, you know, two grams of a MOX or, you know, I'll usually do 500 of uh, Zithromax, um, but. So if it's more complex, I'll start them on a seven day regimen of, you know, amoxicillin, um, you know, start two days prior, finish five days afterwards. Um, so it depends on the case, depends on the complexity. If there's a lot of infection, a lot of periodontal infection, um, it's a case by case scenario, but there's usually some sort of antibiotic in all the implant cases. Do you ever use PRF to gain KT for overdentures if you can't get primary closure and do yes. not want to do perios? periosteal releasing incisions. Yes, that's what I'm doing a lot for the hybrid style. We're not getting primary closure. We're doing just um, you know, two simple horizontal um, sutures and we're getting healing by secondary intent with the PRF. Um, you know, that's gonna increase your keratinized tissue width. So if you have the PRF or the LPRF in between um, your two sutures and you don't, you probably actually don't really even want primary closure, um, that's gonna increase your soft tissue band width. Um, especially an ovate um, sort of prosthetic design on top. I haven't done it too much with overdentures, 
Um, you know, my associate kind of handles the overdentures now. Um, you know, I'm usually stick to more full arch, um, you know, immediate load cases. But um, so I haven't seen it with overdentures, but with our hybrid designs, you know, we don't get, we want to heal by secondary intent with PRF in between keratinized tissue on both sides. All right. That was a lot of questions in a short amount of time. Um, I think we got through everything. Any, any closing thoughts? No, just thank you guys. It was, it was a fun Monday night. <laughs> Let me go back and get in <laughs> before bedtime. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Great information. Always enjoy having you back with us. Um, for those of you interested, we did record this webinar, so we'll get that out to you within a week or so. If you have any questions, feel free to contact Dr. Nice um, directly, or you can email webinars at henryshine.com. Thanks for joining everyone. Have a great night. Thanks. Have a great night, guys.